Well, hi, and thanks for joining me in my shop here as I continue with this uh, Messenger CB radio. And I'm right at the uh, stage of the checking, testing, alignment, head scratching process where I'm focused on the uh, output amplifier, the, the PA, the power amplifier, which is a 7061 tube. And I'm in the process of learning all about this, uh, this radio and uh, transmitters like this because I don't normally work on transmitters. In fact, I almost never do. I really never do. I really, you know, let's get down to it. This is really the first time I put my head to trying to deal with a transmitter. I uh, had fiddled around with some lower frequency ham transmitters, but uh, really without any success and never any tube ones. Although I have a beauty, I have a, I have a beauty tube ham radio amplifier, but not this guy. Anyway, so cutting my teeth on here, so a lot of what you're going to hear on this video is me kind of uh, reviewing what I've come to understand about uh, this radio or, or a radio like this, uh, generally, um, before I go forward because the, with, with making more adjustments, because the, I have a big concern here. I, I, I know my knowledge. I'm smart enough to know I'm stupid. Let's put it that way, <laughs> okay? Um, there's a lot to know about dealing with these transmitters um, and uh, my experience is low with it so you know, I got a good general foundation to approach this stuff but there's issues related to uh, transmitters that I just have never dealt with very much before uh, for instance one of them is neutralization and another one is class C operation well when I first read that in the manual class C operation uh, it made me scratch my head right away because I'm pretty sure, and, and I've reviewed this now, a Class C operation, the tube being operated that way, is not conducting most of the time. So that left me really scratching my head. What is going to the antenna from that output tube? And I've discovered all this now. So I'm going to put up the uh, schematic on the screen here, and I'm going to go over what I've come to understand about the uh, output of this particular radio and some general stuff. So once again, always bear in mind when you're watching my videos, I'm just a guy here trying to figure stuff out and I get things wrong. Yes, I really do get things wrong. And I, I may say things and sound like I'm saying them with authority. I'm not in some cases. And the last thing is, if, if you look in this meter here, watch. You see me. <laughs> yes, that's me. <laughs> I'm inside that meter today. Okay, let's get the schematic up on the screen here. Okay, so here's the whole radio schematic. Uh, mostly receiver up here, transmitter down here, mostly modulator here, uh, and here's the power amp, and here's the antenna. So that gives it kind of the basic layout of things. Really concerned about what's going on over here and with this tube generally. So we're going to zoom in on that. So let's talk about Class C operation, first of all. Um, there's a lot of strong specifications of uh, voltages here on the grid. Here they are listed here. And there's a reason why this grid voltage, like all tubes, this grid voltage has to be where it's supposed to be. And that's because in normal transmitter operation, this tube is cut off except for uh, peaks of uh, the signal coming in here. That sine wave signal coming in here, except for the peaks, um, which drives the grid, I hate to say this positive, but I, I okay, take that as a grain of salt, drives the grid sufficiently in potential to allow tube conduction, let's put it that way. So the tube conducts a little bit of every cycle. So what you get out here is not a nice 27 megahertz sine wave going along. You get this, you get a you, you, you get something doing this, if I can draw it like this. If you think of a uh, half-wave rectifier, you, you can kind of picture what that looks like. Right? It looks like this. But this is even worse, because you're not letting the entire half-wave through. You're only letting the tips or the tops of it through. So you're really getting a little bump, and then a long nothing, and then a bump, and then a long nothing, and then a bump. And that's what's heading for the antenna. The antenna is just over here. Look, it's virtually straight through. But for sure, when you check the antenna, you don't see a bunch of humps. You get a nice 27 megahertz sine wave. So how are they doing that? So here's the trick. They've built a swing. This is a playground. 
you're there with the kid. The kid's on a swing over here. And you're over here. You're the parent, and you're going to make the kid, the kid swing. So he gets on the swing, he pushes himself a bit, and so his swing is swinging. Okay, so the swing is the oscillating circuit between this coil and this capacitor. So there's other capacitors and coils all around here. They're probably all having some kind of effect, including this capacitor here, which I'm assuming represents capacitance to the chassis of the wiring and parts around here. And I'm not really sure what they're showing here, but I assume that's what they're trying to remind you of, that there's a capacitor, a capacitance here too. So anyway, back to the kit on the swing. So his swing is a very fast swing, by the way. It's a 27 megahertz swing. So he's holding on tight while he's swinging back and forth. But if you don't give him a push, right, his swing is just going to wear down into nothing. And he'll be a sad kid on sitting on a swing. So you got to push him. But you got to push him at the right moment. And we've all done this, right? And, and you, you know the effect of it. If you push at the right moment, a little push on the swing will keep him going you have a happy kid. You have a happy kid because he's communicating uh, via uh, sporadic e communications to people in Alabama. So, so how do you get the swing happening? So you tune this to 27 megahertz. You then have the input signal coming from this oscillator also, 27 megahertz. So you have the bumps coming out here, the shoves coming out here running into the swing and shoving it. And if all this is done right, if this is tuned to the same frequency that all this is tuned to, I think this is a crystal controlled oscillator over here, then you'll have an easy time pushing the kid on the swing. But what if the timing is wrong? What if you're going 27 million times a second to push him, but he's not wanting to swing at 27 million times? Maybe he wants to swing at 27 million 100 times a second. It's a little hard to envision, isn't it? Well, that would be like you reaching out to push the kid on the swing while he's still swinging back at you. Now, what would that feel like? Well, as you put your hands out and the swing comes back, whack! What would happen to you as the swing pusher? You would be pushed back you would have to absorb back some of the same energy you pushed in on the last push. Assuming the last push was timed well. And this is your first bad push. Now you've done this. I'm sure you've done this. Like if you try to stop a kid on a swing, you, you, you do this on purpose, right? You have to take back and absorb the energy that was put into the swing. So what would that look like? Well, that looks like some kind of backing up of pressure, current, well, maybe not current, but pressure anyway, back this way. It also looks like the swing is not going to swing well. It's not going to be a pleasant ride on the swing. You're going to have an unhappy kid, and he's going to look back at you and go, why can't you get coordinated here? What's the matter with my dad or my parent? <laughs> so when you're making the adjustments here, what's happening is the crystal controlled pusher is pushing when he pushes. And you can't change this. It's crystal controlled back here. But you can change it a tiny amount, probably, by some adjustment. Maybe, maybe this guy, just a tiny amount. So you got to adjust the kid on that. you got to get the kid swinging right. So you're trying to adjust this. And it's not just a capacitor. It's a capacitor and an inductor. So there's numerous places where this will swing at exactly the right frequency. You can, I, I think there's numerous places. Now take that back. Maybe there isn't. So once you get these guys tuned properly, so a tiny amount of power from here can keep this thing going then you're going to deliver uh, to the antenna a nice, powerful sine wave. I guess, ultimately, there's no power being created in this. It's just a technique for getting power from here to the antenna, the trick being that this tube is not working hard. So you, you could change this from Class C to class, uh, class A operation, and you have a nice sine wave coming out here, and you probably need a much bigger tube to do this. Uh, I think. I think that's basically the, the rules there. So by using this technique of Class C operation and giving little shots of power, uh, you can achieve a higher level of output power with a smaller tube. I think mean, that's kind of what's going on here, I believe.
I do believe. You also, that means also when there's no, ooh, I was going to say when there's no modulation, there's very little power being passed or, or produced by this tube. So I, I'm not sure that's true. Not quite sure. We haven't got to the modulator yet, so that's coming down the road. Now, what about this thing? What about this guy? The neutralization capacitor. So uh, I have a, a, a slightly better than rudimentary understanding of what's going on here. So the rudimentary understanding is this capacitor provides a 180 degree out of phase signal back into the grid somehow. So, somehow. So somehow it gets through here. Back into the grid to compensate for a capacitance that's inherent right inside the tube. So, you know, these are elements, they are a physical distance apart, they have a capacitance. And in some cases, that capacitance can become a very important factor in the operation of the tube. In the case of these, or a tube uh, operating at high frequency, um, their the capacitances are enough to start supporting oscillations in the tube, unwanted oscillations, and other things, I guess, that can happen. So, and if those oscillations are anywhere near the operating frequency, you're in big, big trouble. You're in trouble in any case if this thing oscillates uncontrollably. So, the putting in this capacitor compensates for it. Now, this is where I start having some trouble. I'm, I'm kind of understanding how does a capacitor out here with 180 degrees out of phase signal make the capacitor in here no longer important capacitance in here. I don't understand that part yet so but nevertheless it does and I don't have to fully understand these things uh, I can follow the instructions verbatim you know the challenge in doing that in a radio like this and a, a bench like mine I got a pretty good bench of equipment here is I still don't have exactly what they're specifying and that puts me off into the woods a little bit if I can't follow the directions absolutely verbatim then I'm gonna have to put on my thinking cap figure out what's going on so I can make alternative alternative arrangements that will still achieve the same thing. I'm sure there's many ways to skin this cat. Uh, I was reading about how to adjust a neutralization capacitor with the tube not even operating. So there's, there's many ways to, to skin this cat. Uh, the one in the manual is the one they recommend. It's the one that probably fit with the equipment they had in their laboratory when they were building these radios and designing them in the first place. So. Okay, that's why I need to understand this stuff a little bit more than rudimentary. What can go wrong here? Seriously wrong. Uh, what, what can get damaged here? I'm not sure anything can really get damaged, frankly. Uh, I'm thinking of excess current flowing through the tube, um, high voltages, resonant voltages developing across capacitors and coils that could maybe show up somewhere where they're not intended to show up because I'm so stupid about what this does or I make temporary connections uh, for testing purposes that disturb this in such a way to create oscillations that fry something up. I just don't think I'm, you know, I, I guess it, it's good to have concern about these things. Maybe it's not as great a concern as I might imagine. There's the relay, by the way, snapping the uh, the uh, antenna selector switch from the receiver input to the transmitter output. What else do I need to know here? Well, we need to read through the... I'm sorry about so much talk here, but we need to read through the instructions now for doing the uh, adjustment of the neutralization. So I will, I will put that up now. Here we are. Okay, again, I you know, skip ahead if you wish, but I'm going to read through this. Normally neutralization is only needed when V8 has been replaced. V V8, let's just double check and make sure V8, yes, V8 is the power, power amp. So the reason it's saying that is because these capacitances that we're trying to fight against that are inside the tube are related to the tube's construction, the actual physical arrangement of the elements in the tube. It doesn't matter how hot the tube is or anything like that. 
They, they are what they are and they don't change. But if you change the tube, then you will have changed. Potentially, the new tube will have slightly different uh, distances inside, you know, between its different elements. So, V8 is not being replaced. The assumption I could make is that neutralization is fine in this radio. That would be an assumption. Connect the test equipment. I really don't know why they have this waveform sitting here. I think what it is is they had a lot of white space on the page right here and they put figure six in here because I don't think it's referred to anywhere. So it doesn't seem to have anything to do with what we're talking about. So here we go. Via the transmitter, note the PA grid voltage as L9 is tuned through resonance. Now if you remember, I had trouble spotting resonance in L9. L9 to tune through resonance would require four or five rotations of the slug. That's what I think. If the PA grid voltage increases when L9 is backed out of the coil, I'm going to get my eyeballs on the slug and figure out which way is out of the coil, then the value of C44 is too small. Increase the capacity of C44 half turn. So this is giving you the, the mechanics of how to make the adjustment without even understanding at all what you're actually doing. PA grid voltage increases, that's L9. Turn it further in because the capacitance is too large. Decrease the capacitance, half turn repeat. At the proper setting of C44, the PA grid voltage will rise equally but only slightly or not at all on each side of resonance. The setting of C44 affects the PA plate tuning. Therefore, the following final PA adjustment should be made. Look, the following final PA adjustment. Here we go again, doing L9 C44. Just as we did at the start. The last adjustment out of tuning L9 for the dip. And the plate current. Uh, it's just to maximize efficiency, I suppose. While keeping PA current. Or what's happening is uh, the PA current, the power amp plate current is, is going down because it's facing into, or it's, it's trying to blow into the resonant circuit, which is not interested in the, you know, the kit on the swing is swinging quite fine here, I guess I could say. Yeah, this kit on the swing model doesn't quite fit here. Uh, close. While keeping the PA plate current at the desired value. A lot I got, so I got to make like multiple observations. I'm twiddling three different things here, looking at a couple of different meters. The RF line current is typically 230 milliamps. RF line current. Now you're putting out a quarter of an amp. A quarter of an amp. Uh, let's think about that. A quarter. Uh, can you do this quarter of an amp of RF into a 50 ohm antenna? Can you just simply do like an I squared R thing there? Uh, one quarter squared and a pretty small number. Quarter of a quarter. Um, and then uh, times 50. So if you do a quarter of a quarter, that's a sixteenth, isn't it? And a sixteenth of fifty. That's roughly two, two, two to three. Not two to three, two to three watts. I don't know. I guess that's reasonable. I never imagined, you know, a quarter of an amp flowing in the antenna. So that's going to go into my little resistor. But really, the most we should be getting out of this radio is four watts of power, and my little resistor, I'm sure, is a. I'm not sure. I think it's at least a five watt resistor. Uh, not worried about. It. Okay. Uh, is there something more on the next page? Oh, just the diagrams. Is there any more talk? And then the parts list. No. So that's it. That's the end of the that's the end of the row here. So we don't have a whole pile of steps just. And so going over what I did on the last end of the last video, I did not get a good feeling for any of this. Um, certainly the capacitor, you can really see the up and down effects of adjusting the capacitor, but the inductor L9, not sharp at all. Well, maybe as we go through this and we improve the uh, C44, maybe we'll find that L9 gets sharper or something like that. So the first, let's read the first thing we want to do. 
connect the equipment like that. Key the transmitter, note the PA grid voltage. So I gotta have a uh, grid voltage meter. So then we start watching uh, the uh, voltage go up and down and we do all, and then we do start and then we start adjusting C44. So the adjustment of C44 is all about what's going on with this tuning of L9 and the grid voltage. Yeah, that's all it is. C4 is, uh, affects the plate tuning. You've probably got to go around and around a few times on this. And bearing in mind, chances are it's all set properly. If it's set properly, then what would happen here is I tune it through resonance, we would see the voltage increase will be equally, slightly, equally or not at all on each side of the resonance. Really, it's all about measuring that voltage. Okay, I think I got it. I think I'm ready. Okay, so this next step is going to involve adjusting a capacitor C44 uh, or checking its adjustment. And, and in the manual, it says you should not have to adjust this unless the tube has been changed. So, you know, I may very well skip this stage, especially if I can figure out a way of determining if it's adjusted correctly without actually adjusting it. Because here, take a closer look at it. So it's that big screw head you're looking at right here. This is the capacitor here, this adjustment right here. Here, look at it from above. Let me get a better perspective on it there. There we are. So you see there's a locking nut down at the bottom of that screw shaft. And what looks like a locking nut to me. Um, chances are you'd have to loosen that off a bit. Uh, that in itself could cause the screw to, to, to move a little bit. Oh my gosh. Talking about the screw moving a little bit. Oh, there's nothing tight about the screw at all. Okay, I'm going to move it and I'm going to move it right back. Oh, it's as loose as can be. Oh my gosh. Holy smokes. I'm sure it's not supposed to be that loose. Surely it's not supposed to do this. You'd be uh, driving down the road with this in your car. This thing would be rattling back and forth. Uh, almost certainly affecting the, out the output. Uh, so you <laughs> can actually, actually be able to hear this rattling down the road. Look at that. It is. It's really loose. Well, I'm glad I touched it. I think I've moved it now too much. Who's to say it's where it's supposed to be now? Um, uh, just as an example, uh, I have a, uh, I had a vaporizer, one of these ones that works uh, with a vibrating diaphragm, just breaks the water up, and, like a cool mist humidifier. I had two of them, in fact. One of them uh, stopped working. When I uh, took it, I went to take it apart and discovered that three screws had backed out. Uh, and these are screws that had driven into plastic. Um, very uncharacteristically, uh, three three screws, and, and not just out a little bit. They were out four or five screw turns. They were right out. Now, either they were never put in in the first place by the manufacturer, which isn't very likely, or because of the vibrating, there's a little, little, you know, the thing that breaks up the water here. Those vibrations caused these three screws, all three of them, to back out. I mean, it's hard to believe, but it, it is what it was. I had to throw that vaporizer in the garbage in the end because with the screws backed out, water leaked down and got into the electronics. A surprising amount of electronics inside one of those vaporizers. So that's the story there. But the lesson is vibrations loosen things. I mean, we all know this, don't we? So has this thing wandered back? Was this ever in a car? Did anybody ever use this radio? <laughs> I don't know the answer to any of these questions. I have no idea the history of this thing. Okay, but for sure we're going to have to check that now uh, because there's every reason to think it's possible the screw may have wandered off. Okay, good, I think. I think we can call that good. What now? Um, so let, let's get the radio operating here. And I'm going to reread the manual a little bit while we let the radio warm up for a little while and get get ready get ready to do the uh, 
do the adjustment of the neutralizing capacitor. Okay, so I, I think I'm ready to uh, try this. Let's make sure it's on the dummy antenna. Just realized a problem here. When I go to put my... So I'm in low light levels here. That's why my hands appear uh, stuttery. Um, when I go to insert this into here, uh, the camera's right in the way. How am I going to deal with this? I think it's a simple thing. Just put this over here. Okay, we'll switch to this camera now. Oh no, I don't think we will. You know what? I don't need this camera. You don't need to see a close-up of that. Neither do I. So the objective here now is to key the transmitter, read the grid voltage on the PA, and adjust this uh, slug up and down from where it is now and see if this voltage doesn't go down in both cases. If that's what's happening, all is good. If this goes down in both cases, good. If not, now the assumption is too, I have this at its resonant point from the previous tuning that I did. Get this to go in here. I need a little bit of a smaller one here. I hope I'm not turning it. There we are. Okay. We're all set. We should see this rise up to one or two. Just just barely come up. And this should come up somewhere. Not I can't remember where. It's going to be. It's not very high. Uh, oh, it's uh, 20 volts. If I remember right. So we'll put this on the 50 volt scale. 20 should bring it up in this range. Should be easy to see. Put my hand like this. Watch the meter over there. I think we're golden. Okay, first a test transmission. Oh, this fell out. A little test. Watch. I can't watch everything at once, so let's turn this meter on too. This one is telling us the current in the PA plate uh, circuit. If it reads, for instance, one volt, that means. What's that mean? That means one volt. 10 milliamps. One volt is 10 milliamps. We're shooting for 22 or less. So we don't want to see 2.2 volts over there. We're in trouble. Something going on here. We're in trouble. Something weird going on in there. Trouble everywhere. I think I'm ready. First to test. Here we go. Okay. Two watts at 1.8. And over here we're upscale. So I can see it. Let's go a little higher. Okay. So I'm on the 15 volt scale. We're reading uh, 8 or 9 volts here. Now, turn this one way and watch this voltage. Should go down. Turn it the other, put it back. Turn it the other way. Should go down. Down in both cases. Okay, I don't think I want to try tuning through resonance. That's what the recommendation is. I'm assuming we're at resonance right now. And I'm going to tune off. Here we go. Watching this meter really carefully now. Okay, turning one way. Going up. Going up a lot. Turn the other way, going down. Okay, so question is now, what do I do? Okay, so I'm going to turn this. This is turning counterclockwise. I'm going to read the instructions again because obviously adjustment is required. Uh, counterclockwise. Here, let, let's look at it together. Okay, we're down here, right here. Note the PA grid voltage as L9 is tuned through resonance. So I believe it's at resonance and I'm tuning it off. But that may not be true. Maybe I didn't tune it through resonance. If the PA grid voltage increases when L9 is backed out of the coil. Okay, so this is, this is a bit of an issue. What do they mean by that exactly? So the slug in L9 is right at the bottom from my perspective. The top, if you had this radio sitting normally you would say the slug is at the top um, it's it's at the end of the coil I think part of it is sticking out I can't really see from the end I'm looking at so backing out so I wasn't backing it out of the coil 
I was backing it in and the grid voltage was going okay so let's, let's follow this exactly right L9 backed out of the coil so I should turn it the other way and then we'll note what happens to the voltage and then I'll come read this maybe I can do it right now PA grid voltage increases when L9 is backed out of the coil C4 is too small it must be increased so let's see if we can just get that in simple English here so L9 goes out voltage goes up capacitor must be increased yes I've just become too simple minded <laughs> to uh, I, I just can't handle three thoughts at once okay it backing it out backing it out is turning it clockwise I'm going to drive it further down into the coil but actually out the other end I think that's backing out I hope I got that right most accidents happen when you're backing up so we'll see what happens here fire it up and we'll back it out going down going down backing out means it goes down when we back it out down, we back, goes down when we back it out. We backed it out, it increases. If it's too small, it's too big. In my case, it's too big. Increase it, I gotta shrink it. That, that's all written down here. Half turn and repeat it. Okay, so, I, so I'm in a mode of reducing the capacitance and then observing the effect a half turn at a time. Okay, now I need another. Oh, they can use the same. No, let me get another uh, tool here. Just let me get one that's going to help. This one. This one might. The screw is very, very. Uh, so I'm trying, trying to feel how much spring is in that. The, uh, the screw was really easy to turn. So it was. Uh, it was decrease was back it out half a turn and repeat the test 180 degrees repeat the test we back it out and see what happens okay back it out here we go back it out going down back it out going down another half turn we want to back this out another half turn. I'm backing everything out. Back it out. I hope I got this right. Here we go again. Still going down, but not, not as uh, sharply. Okay, let's go another half turn. Now, if you don't neutralize a transmitter like this, you're running the risk of, uh, of uh, oscillations occurring in it, unwanted oscillations. Here we go. Back out the slug. Still going down. Okay, let me double, I'm just going to read on my own site. Give me a moment. I'm just going to reread this myself and see if I got this wrong. PA grid voltage increases when L9 is backed up. It's not. The grid is decreasing. Therefore, C44 is too big. And you must back that out too. Yep, yeah, I'm doing it right. I'm doing it right. I'm doing it right. Let's keep going. Uh, another another turn here. Ooh, that was a big one. I'm not sure. I think I might might have gone 360 on that. <laughs> here we go again. Watching the meter. Up. Still going down. Maybe we should do the resonance check now and see if we've got uh, the, the initial step before doing neutralization was to set up the PA uh, output uh, filter, if you like, roughly. Then do this neutralization, then go back and set it up roughly. They want you to set it up roughly because they want it close at the start. 
And I've already turned this a little bit. Maybe it's no longer close. I gotta close close it up before I continue with the neutralization. That's my thinking. Okay, so that means doing the uh, coil and that means doing this capacitor and this coil here. Proud that I can remember that. So um, that was a matter of adjusting it for maximum power output, wasn't it? Wasn't that all there really was to it? And watching the current flow here. Let's just reread that again. Adjust L9 for a dip in the plate current. Oh, that's right. It's L9 that generates the dip. I've been making a mistake here. Big mistake being made. I've been making a big mistake. I'm turning the wrong coil. Somewhere I'm turning the wrong coil. L9, L9, L9. It's all about L9. Okay, I think I've been turning the wrong coil. Uh-oh, 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 uh-oh. Uh, uh, L9. Okay, hang on one second here. L9. Oops. L9. This is how you know these videos are live. L9, I've been turning the wrong coil. Why did I start? It's L7 I've been farting around with. Oh, no. That's C44, right? L7. Why, why did I start farting around with L7? I'm, I'm, I'm about to go from making a mistake to making a, a mistake on top of a mistake. There's L7. Look at this thing all messed up here. Adjust the oscillator plate coil L7 for maximum negative voltage on the PA grid. Okay, you know, I gotta right back to the start here because I, I I don't know now. Did I mess this up? I don't know. Again, you know, this is what happens when you're doing the I've never done this before, I've never seen this radio before, so first time through, you're bound to make mistakes. I am, anyway. So we, we skipped this adjustment and we skipped and went to this one, L7. L7 is the coil I am now adjusting. Oh, I got this all messed up. Adjust the oscillator plate coil L7 for maximum negative voltage on the PA grid. Typical is minus 18, minimum minus 13. This is about setting up the 7061 tube so it will run in class C properly. Okay, let's go back and do this. Okay, so in, in reviewing the manual, I've kind of concluded that I may have made some bad mistakes here in confusing L9 and L7. This is in L7 right now, but I should have been adjusting L9 up here, and I was fiddling around with L7. L7 is one of the first things that gets adjusted. Seems to me I did L9. I, I, I don't know. I don't know what happened to me. I don't know what happened to me. So we're going to step back. We're stepping back now. I'm going to return this roughly to where it was, because I think I really messed up. Okay, roughly where it was. I'm going to return this. This is roughly where it was anyway, so I really haven't moved this. So the name of the game now is to get back to adjusting L7. See, I got to read the manual again. L7. L7 to get the right uh, uh, plate current. Really? Is that, is that what it is, Jim? Check. Okay. L7 maximum negative voltage on here on the uh, grid oh that's on this meter that's on this meter that's right this is not grid this is a uh, current this is the grid voltage boy I tell you if there's a way to make a mistake I can find it so I think I must have really messed this up before watching this now maximum please yeah it's supposed to be way up here Ah, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Perhaps there's a whole raft of comments about this <laughs> in my video. Because, uh, you know, you're watching me make mistakes, and you may realize the mistake I'm making. I'm sure it happens all the time. I don't realize it yet. So that's the joy of watching my videos. Okay, here we go. Going up higher. Oh, there's the top. 
that's about on this meter that's 16 17 volts okay so I got that set right now and next we now do L9 which is the other one for a dip and then C47 for the desired current at the dip okay L9 for the dip C49 for the current L9 for the dip Okay, I'll leave that in there. L9. Nine, the dip is going to show up over here. I remember doing this. Let's do it again. Okay, watching for a dip now. 1 8. See, it's going to slowly go up. Okay, we're going down going up. Oh, don't quit on me, meter. That's interesting. It's going way down. Hold it. Don't, don't go away, meter. It's going to go away any moment. Don't go away now. I've had this transmitting for a while. Should have should have reset it maybe before we started. Again, I'm not really getting a good feeling from this at all. Okay, transmit. It's pretty stable there. It's going up. It's coming down. It's going up. Right in here. I'd say that's the dip. Okay, we think we found the dip. I mean, what do we think we need to do after that? Make the last adjustment that of tuning L9 for a dip. Adjust C49 for the desired plate current at the dip. So C49 for plate current. Okay, let's do that. C49. It's this guy. Plate current. Desired plate current. The desired plate current was 22. 2.2. .2. We're gonna get there. There's not much capacitor left here. That's about the end of it. 2.1. 2.1, after you adjust that, I think you go back and do the, uh, do this guy again for maximum voltage over here. Doing something wrong, aren't I? Is it this one? This one for maximum voltage. Uh, not sure. Am I supposed to go back to that? Make the last adjustment. L9 for a dip. L9 for a dip. C49 for the desired current at the dip. L9 to locate the dip. Okay, let's do L9 again. L9. L9. So what I was doing. So what I was doing. L9. So now we watch that meter over there and look for a dip. 2.062. Oh, 
this would be so much easier with a. Uh, there's absolutely no no dip happening here. This is just this is what happened last time, isn't it? This just didn't show any kind of a dip. So I moved this control a mile just now and I didn't see anything happen. So that tells me I got something wrong here. This back roughly where it was. Oh my gosh. The adjustment is not seeming to work. Okay, I'm gonna study up on the chart, on the information here. Try to catch what it is I'm not doing right. Okay, so I'm going to try something completely different here. I have the uh, CB radio switched off. In fact, it's even unplugged. It's completely off. And I'm going to inject into it, I am injecting into it right now, a signal from the signal generator. It's at 27.6 megahertz, just kind of randomly picked around 27.6. I'm feeding that into basically the plate of the output tube. And this is not on, right? This is off. So we're just doing this passively. So I'm basically feeding a signal in where the radio produces the class C pulse. Let's put it that way. So I'm feeding in a, a regular sine wave, hopefully, from the signal generator. And then the output at the antenna, actually I have to do it at the relay because the antenna relay uh, with the set not plugged in it is set for receive. So, um, so, I, so I've got that connected, that's what this is. This is going over to the scope, and this is the signal from the signal generator after passing through the tuned circuit. So that's what I'm thinking, the, uh, that with this arrangement, without any fear of doing any harm to anything, I can play around with that capacitor and that inductor, and I can get the highest peak on here. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to tune the signal generator back and forth, and we'll see this go up and down, hopefully. A little bit anyway and where it's the highest I will then take note of the frequency uh, that it's resonating at which should be somewhere around channel 15 about halfway through the CB band that, that, that this radio covers which is actually a very narrow band of frequencies uh, all things considered okay so watching the scope I will vary the frequency here and we'll see what happens smaller Bigger, bigger. Oh, so I'd say it's right in here. I'd say it's right there. Okay, and what frequency are we tuned to? Hey, this might have been worth doing. Can you see the number there? You can't really. Come on, read it for yourself. Twenty-nine point three. Way, way off. Now, so when I. I'm going to assume that I'm seeing the result, the resonant result of, uh, of the two components I want to adjust. So I'm going to just do the standard alignment thing. I'm going to aim for the frequency I want a little bit. So I'm going to reduce this from 29.3, say, to 29. And then I'm going to make adjustments and see if I can make that uh, scope display uh, bigger. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, the power of the finger. Look at that. Just, just my finger. <laughs> just the camera effect. It's a camera doing that. It's not the scope. Right. So we will turn the frequency down a bit here and watch the scope. I can't make the scope display any bigger. I, I tried a couple things. Too bad I can't. Wish I could. I'm just thinking now. Is, is there is isn't there some way of like a invert beam finder? None of those are going to help me. Uh, and this is locked on. If I if I make it smaller, I just can't get any more juice onto it. I tried some other. I mean, you can't see the scope. I tried some other uh, leads here to try to, you know, this 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 kind of lead when you plug it in, and the control here becomes limited to where it is now. I can't go down to the real sensitivity, which is five millivolts. It's stuck at fifty. Anyway, tried my best, couldn't do it. Just reviewed it. Didn't come up with any new ideas. Okay, so I'm gonna. Down 28.5 now. So I'll start making adjustments here on the radio. I'm 
do this capacitor first because it's way out from where it was. I'm not going to return this capacitor. I'm going to return the capacitor to where it was. Let's watch the scope while I do it. Well, I didn't see any change at all. Let's do it a little more rapidly. Ah, there's something there. Definitely something there. So put it back where it's supposed to be. Or where it was, where I found it. We'll look for the resonant point here now. Resonant point is, oh my gosh, it's gone the wrong way here. Oh, there's another one coming. Oh my, oh my my, look at that. Hmm, so this frequency is 12.1 megahertz. Definitely, definitely a, a, a peak there, eh? 10.8. Let's get it right on the money here. 11.1 .1 is the actual. So that'd be 22.2. I don't know. I don't know what that means. It's way off from where this radio operates. So we'll go about back up to where the radio operates. And we'll find another resonance. Here it comes. Okay, so I can't dial up high enough on this band. I'm stuck at 32 megahertz. Oh my gosh. So it's got to be that coil. The coil was... Uh, well, here we go. Let's let's just go down to 27 something, 28, 27, 28 megahertz, and turn the coil. Wow, I'm just messing this radio rate up, aren't I? That's what happens, though. Get in there. Here we go. Can I peak that up? You know, it's the same thing. It's no change. This is usually the point where I go, I'm doing the wrong coil. Anybody see anything happen there? Okay, so we're getting down. I, I, I moved this out a long ways there. You see my hand? Yeah, you can. So I'm moving it back in. More to go. Get it back to kind of where it was. Okay. We're not, this is just... Wow. How come this thing has no impact? At all? I really, I really am turning the wrong thing. That's a heartbreaker if I am. Okay, let me look. I hate to do this. I'm going to just look myself on the schematic. Uh, this might be a very depressing situation here. Let's see. On the schematic, the coil I am adjusting is... Uh, I should be adjusting L9. Oh my god, I've been doing L7. I did move it right up. Oh yeah, L7's way L7. Oh. L7 is associated with the output of the crystal oscillator. So that affects the drive on the grid of the power amp. I should have been fiddling around with L9. And just in case I've got L9 and L7 mixed up in my head, i got to relocate them on the diagram here. Let's see. Um, so, what did I say I was supposed to be turning? <laughs> so, L9 is what I've been fiddling around with just now. L9, and then go back to the schematic and find out that it's supposed to be L9. Okay, so I've been doing the right one. That's kind of depressing. Because it doesn't seem to have any effect. What's wrong with the test, the way I'm doing it? I'm feeding a signal in to pin 9 on the 7601 tube. That's right. That's definitely pin 9. Signal going in. All it does from there is just go through some passive components. And then I'm picking it up 
at the relay contact down here. Okay, let's try this. Where is it resonating? So again, it's, okay, so it's resonating just below the 32. So I cranked it down to 30. First the uh, capacitor here. Now if I just move this camera a little bit. Get a little better view of what I'm doing. Watching the scope. Look at the difference there. Oh, so, so there's the resonant point. Is there another one? Well, this kind of capacitor goes round and round and round, so there's a lot, so it's going to encounter the same capacitance again and again. So that's max there. And what happens if I fiddle with this coil, which seems to do nothing? Now maybe there's a super sharp peak here that I've got to find. on that uh, indicating voltmeter to see a tiny tiny variation 27 megahertz boy have I got meters that'll do 27 megahertz maybe yeah. maybe this one I, I don't think so that's pretty darn high what about the guy right behind him his range is not written on it but I think it's a 5 megahertz meter I'm not sure can't read it directly. He says, thinking hard about it. Well, let's just keep working this then, since the uh, coil doesn't seem to do anything. Let's go down. Okay, so we're down around 29 now. So I don't like this because this capacitor is heading towards its limit. I see, I see, I see two peaks there. Bum, 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 bum. Oh, the reason I see two peaks is because I'm swinging past the, uh, you know, it's a, uh, it's a uh, 360 degree capacitor, so it's always going to find two peaks. Right there. This is not working out well at all. What, what if I, uh, if I back this way out? Maybe this is what happens. Let me back this out. The coil. I see nothing happening, but maybe when I turn this now, I'll see that the peak has actually moved. Well, yeah. If it did, it wasn't much. Let's back this guy way out. crazy out. Now what's happened to that peak? I wouldn't say anything is different. I'd say it's all about this capacitor. But the service manual says otherwise. Okay, I'm turning this back roughly in the area it was in before I disasterized all this. Going down. Frequency. So the peak is showing up around here, around 30. No. Should be 27. You know, 27 and a half or something like that. Can we get there? Let's see what kind of peak we get with this. You can, still, you can get a peak in an untuned circuit. He says, making people think for a while. Take nobody home at this point. There's a slight thing going on there. Hardly see it.
seem to get a little smaller there. Right, it just seems to be right out of range. So either this is a completely bogus test I'm doing here. That the uh, instruments I've hooked up have thrown the circuit off. That's quite possible. Throwing the circuit right off. And I'm wasting my time doing this. out. I think my testing technique is uh, failing here. I think that's what's happening. Let me review the situation. The painful, painful situation. Okay, I got a new test set up here. Uh, I've removed the direct connection of the signal generator where it was injecting the signal into the radio because the output of my signal generator, I've got a little uh, gizmo on it here, uh, it's about 200 ohms. And that's probably just just killing that, that circuit when I hook it up. So what I've done, instead of hooking it up directly with clip leads, I now have the signal generator uh, feeding into this coil. There's a little coil here. And I'm placing the coil in a sensitive area, so I believe, so we can see on the scope. Can we see it on the scope? Anywhere? Anybody? Let me see it on the scope no matter what. Figure that out. Why would we see this? I don't have anything connected to the radio from the signal generator. Um, feeding, feeding backwards. It's feeding backwards through here, I bet. Let's, let's reduce. Reduce. That seemed to go up. It shouldn't feed back. There's a relay in here that's open. Oh my god. So this, whatever is happening, suggests a peak 30.4. Okay, look, let's, let's carry on. Let's, however that signal is getting into the radio it is, let's play with it. So see, I I think I've probably greatly improved this arrangement, this test setup, somehow. Okay, so we'll max that. And we'll play with the inductor. Wow. We're feeding in 30 though. I don't want 30. I want 27. Oh, there's a little peak there at 27 or somewhere. It's like a big flat spot. Okay, so it starts at 29, phooey, and goes up from there. So we want to get this. Okay, so there's the peak 29.2. That's the same place as I started, wasn't it? I'll just turn it down a little bit. See if we can get it back up. Yep. But it's resulting in this, this capacitor going into a position where it never was. Okay, so we're at we're at 28.4. Oh my gosh. So why would this, this adjustment be doing nothing? Because it's the wrong adjustment. That's the usual answer, Jim. Because a component has failed, or it's doing exactly what it's supposed to do, that seems to have gotten smaller in the long run. Well, I should put my, uh, power, my uh, power drill on this and fire this thing in like a bullet. How fast can I turn this? Anybody see anything <laughs> happen there?
really, really messed this up. I can always return this capacitor to exactly where it was set. Seven six. See, I mean, it still shows a peak, right? But it's not. It's not the grand daddy peak, which is up at up at this frequency up here, twenty nine point five. I'm gonna leave it high and see if turning this will knock it down. I don't know. So this is not your basic tank circuit, I don't think. This is a uh, this is not a tank circuit. It's like a I don't know if you call it a pi or a T, a T network or a pi network. I don't think pi fits. Yeah, uh, mm, no, uh. So I'm gonna look at the schematic some more because <laughs> uh, it ain't working here. Okay, I'm gonna try this. Try injecting the signal in another location <laughs> directly. Yep. You know, the problem with using this coil thing, and I think that's what's happening here, is the signal can get into the radio uh, all over the place. Uh, and it can get... So I, I can't really control the injection of the signal well. If I'm going to use an inductive technique here. So I'm going to try to inject the signal now on the far side of a fairly large resistor, which is this one. Oop, what was that? That's my scope need popping off. That's to, to get some isolation. It's only 4,000 ohms. Well, maybe we'll get some isolation out of it. There we go. Okay. Uh, now I'll vary the input signal. We'll watch the scope is even lower now. Okay, but the peak, the peak, according to that, is right here, 29.5. Let us fiddle now. I wish I had a little more juice coming out of here. There's a little more. What does the inductor do? What does the inductor say? Wah, wah. That's what the inductor says. It certainly talks about resonance in the uh, manual. I want the resonance to be too sharp here, right? Because it has to cover a range of frequencies, roughly a megahertz, from 27 to 28, roughly. Possibility is a component that is off a uh, capacitor or something involved in the circuit that is uh, just way off. I don't know how possible that is. Again, another very likely thing is uh, the way I'm doing this just is, is uh, fool's paradise here. Boy, I, I, I didn't get any good feelings from any of this. I got a lot of bad feelings from all of this stuff. Because what it's doing to me is it's just raising questions without answers. Too many questions. Is there a bad component in here? Is my test technique faulty? Am I not following the manual correctly when I'm trying that? Is there something going on with this inductor that... Uh... You know what else? I am attempting to do this with no antenna connected. So I, I don't have the proper load on... Uh, it just as when I hooked up the test equipment it can throw the uh, readings off without the proper load on there. That would be the same sort of thing, wouldn't it? I would think so. I think I can close that relay. Close that relay and then I can, I can load this properly with the dummy antenna. Or I have to somehow fit a dummy in there. Let's see if we can close the relay. So, 
put this way over here. And when the relay closes, we should see a little bit of a hop on there. Ooh. That's my finger doing it. So I don't think you can see it on camera at all, but in fact, when I close the relay, uh, there's a fuzz that appears here. Fuzz. Hey, let's get rid of the fuzz. We'll put the, because uh, this is open. Da, 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 da. Make sure the dummy load is on here. Close it now. It ain't no fuzz showing up. Okay. So we still have the signal going in, don't we? The signal going in. Well, I, I, I put it back here. Let, let's put it back on the actual plate, even though I think that disturbs the signal, disturbs things. Let's see what we get. What do we get? We get we get this to fall off. That's what we get. Okay, that should be pin nine on the output tube. We'll close the relay here. Can you, can you get disappointed here? Why, why is it closing the relay? It doesn't seem to trigger anything. Got this correct. It's because I put on a load, the dummy load, and it's just beating the life out of the signal. Okay, let's take off the dummy load. Okay, close the relay. What? You know, I'm starting to lose track of what I'm even doing. It's a sad day in Jim's shop. I gotta come up with something way better than what I'm doing here. I, I, I gotta rethink this whole, whole deal. I gotta think the whole thing over again. Uh, either either I'm, I'm really dealing with a component failure I haven't recognized yet in the output of this radio, or I don't know what I'm doing, which is far more likely the case. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see, I gotta get ready to go out and plow snow. Oh my gosh, it's one o'clock, yes. I have to get out and uh, clear my driveway of lots of snow. Thanks for watching, and uh, I'm going to try to brighten up my, uh, my brain for tomorrow's session. See ya.